Hello, science lovers. Welcome to tonight's Teen Science Cafe. We appreciate you joining us. Remember to be respectful to guests in the chat as our moderators will be keeping an eye out for any inappropriate comments. Also, check us out at Teen Science Cafe Raleigh on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Tonight, we've got an exciting guest for you. Dr. Emily Barr is a certified registered nurse anesthetist, or CRNA, who works at various hospitals delivering high quality anesthesia care. She is from Greensboro, North Carolina, and has worked in various institutions around the area, getting all of her degrees from UNC System Schools. Outside her work life, Dr. Barr enjoys traveling internationally with her husband, staying active, and is always up for trying something new. Please welcome Dr. Barr. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Welcome. My name is Emily. You do not have to call me Dr. Barr. We are going to be doing the science of anesthesia tonight. I want to give a big shout out and thank you to all of the teen cafe coordinators, the adults and the teens. You have a great group of people here, and this is an excellent opportunity for the young adults and teens of our community and state and the surrounding areas to learn about different areas of science. So let's get started. Okay, so our outline for today, we're gonna give a little bit more information about me and my journey to becoming a nurse anesthetist. We're gonna talk about the history of anesthesia and the anesthesia care team. We're gonna talk about the educational journey to becoming a CRNA and an anesthesiologist. We're gonna talk a little bit about some anesthesia anatomy and terminology. We're gonna do some technology and equipment that we use in anesthesia. We'll do a little bit of pharmacology, which essentially just means drugs and medications. And then we're gonna see it into my work environment and everyday routine. And of course, we have to touch on COVID-19 and the impact on anesthesia and all of us at home. And then finally, will be the simulation, which will tie everything together that we've discussed today. So as we said, my name is Dr. Emily Barr, but please call me Emily. I am from Greensboro, North Carolina, and I grew up here in North Carolina. I'm a fellow North Carolinian, so I'm proud to call NC home. I currently work in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, but my education, as that was introduced, I spent time at UNC Wilmington, UNC Chapel Hill, UNC Greensboro. So let's start off from when I was about your age. So when I was in middle school and high school, I had an innate desire to care for people. I really attribute most of that to my father who would take me to visit my great grandmother every weekend. And I really just enjoyed um being a caregiver for her. It felt very natural to me. And if I'm having any windows pop up, I'm sorry about that. But um, so from there, my high school offered a medical careers program, which enabled me to attain my certified nursing assistant certification, which normally you can get out of community college in about six months. So this was awesome that I was able to, excuse me, I went ahead. I was able to um, get that CNA certification while I was in high school. And so I was able to work in different areas of healthcare at a young age. I knew by the time I was applying for college that I wanted to do something in healthcare, yet I didn't know exactly what. And I'm sure most of you feel this way. You know, you're trying to think about which college you want to go to, what do you want your career to be? And that's a really big decision to make. So I went to UNC Wilmington and did a biology degree. I took all the biology and chemistry courses, and I kind of just tried to expose myself to different experiences and learn the, um, what I was actually most interested in. So this led me to working in hospitals, to taking a medical mission trip to the Dominican Republic and functioning in the operate, operating room down in um, a third world country. I also was able to, um, let me see if I can get this to move out of the way here. <laughs> let me stop share. Can I have Michael 
come on and just make sure I'm not doing something wrong on this. I think you're all good. Okay, was Everything anything popping up? I was having banners pop up on my end. No, we're good on our side. Are you seeing that? Okay, sorry. You're good. I apologize. Okay. I was having a lot of banners pop up for emails and things. I didn't want to um, be too distracted and be distracting y'all. Okay. So after that, I, um, I also went to uh, finish my biology degree and worked in a hospital. I could see the comparison between nurses and physicians. And I was able to kind of realize that those professions were very different but I think my calling was more for nursing. So I finished my biology degree. I decided to go to Chapel Hill and do my nursing program. And I completed my bachelor's in nursing. I worked four years as an ICU registered nurse. I worked in Greensboro and then I did travel assignments in Texas and in Florida. From there, I went ahead and applied to UNCG's nurse anesthesia program and received my doctorate of nursing practice. So my path was very long and windy. It took me about 10 years, which is okay, but I definitely feel like I ended up where I needed to be. So today, besides the educational and professional side of me, I want to show you some pictures, which I already kind of skipped to, but this is what we like to do for fun. So my husband and I really enjoy international traveling. Of course, we haven't been able to do that in 2021. Um, we have some pictures here from our favorite trips that were in the past five years. So we have New Zealand, Machu Picchu, the Great Wall of China. We have bungee jumping in New Zealand and that's in Kuala Lumpur. That's um, with my husband and my sister. Here's some more pictures. This was of course in Sydney, Australia. So we climbed the Sydney Harbor Bridge and that is the Sydney Opera House in the background. And then that's us dog sledding in Greenland and in Jackson, Wyoming. So those are just some of the fun things we did. We love to travel, but we're also fine just staying at home for now and working and hanging out with family and friends. So why are we here? We're here to talk about anesthesia. So to do that, let's start from the beginning, the start of anesthesia and a little bit of history. So anesthesia really began in the mid 19th century. So we're talking the mid 18th, like around 1850s, okay? This was given in the form of ether, nitrous oxide, and chloroform. Nitrous oxide is something you're probably more familiar with. That's usually given in dentist offices and it's called um, laughing gas. So you've probably heard of that if you had a filling or something. The first public surgery that was watched was October 16th in 1846. And that was in Boston, Massachusetts. So as you can see in this picture, it looks like they're putting somebody to sleep. So that had a bit, it was almost like a big arena in there and they were, had an audience watching this. And that was the first time anesthesia was given publicly and they could see someone fall asleep, have surgery, not feel it and wake up and be fine. So that was groundbreaking. And that is an actual tourist attraction that you can still visit if you're ever up in Boston, Massachusetts. I haven't been to the Ether Dome, but it's on my bucket list. From there, um, nurse anesthesia really became popular during the Civil War era when nurses would go out on the field and deliver anesthesia to wounded soldiers. And then we have Alice McGall. She's the mother of anesthesia. So you have the Mayo Clinic is where she started. That's in Rochester, Minnesota, if you've ever heard of it. And the Mayo brothers who started this hospital system decided, who do we want to anesthetize our patients? Do we want that to be a nurse or do we want it to be a doctor, like a student doctor, like an intern? And around the late 1800s, a lot of student doctors were the ones giving the anesthesia because we didn't really know a lot about it. It was unsafe. It was highly specialized. And so the Mayo brothers thought, let's let nurses do this because we think the student doctors would be just too distracted by the surgeries. So Alice McCall became known as the mother of anesthesia. She gave over 14,000 anesthetics um, without any harm to patients and did that safely. She also taught several nurse anesthetists of her time how to deliver anesthesia safety. So she is considered a pioneer for our profession. All right, so what is anesthesia? This picture here on the right is our anesthesia gas machine, and we're gonna talk a lot about that tonight. 
So anesthesia is the complete or partial loss of sensation to surgical stimulation. So this can be lo a localized coverage or total body coverage. And there's different anesthesia types because we don't need to knock somebody completely out and have them completely be asleep just to remove something like an ingrown toenail. So you have general anesthesia. That's gonna be if you needed to have your appendix out. Some of you, um, this is very common in young children to get have like an um, appendicitis or have a ruptured appendix. And so that would be called an appendectomy and you would have general anesthesia for that because they would cut into your abdominal air cavity. And so because they're in your stomach and it's a big incision and there's a lot of tissue and organs around there, you need to be completely relaxed and completely asleep. I think we would all agree on that. Next is a regional anesthetic. So regional anesthesia is something like if you were to have a baby. So you can, you've probably heard of an epidural. So epidural is a form of regional anesthesia. Then that would numb a mother enough to deliver a baby without having um, complete filling down there. And then the next is moderate sedation. And so moderate sedation is something where you're given medicine through your IV and you're kind of in this, what we call a twilight sleep. So you're kind of asleep, but not really, but you're breathing for yourself. This would be for something like a colonoscopy. And none of y'all have probably had that. I know, um, but maybe your parents have. And then lastly is local anesthesia. So this is where is if you had to get even, let's cut, say an ingrown toenail or a mole on your skin, you can inject some an local anesthetic like a lidocaine around that area of your skin and remove that mole. And so anesthesia just kind of embodies these main topics down here, surgical anesthesia, analgesia, amnesia, and muscle relaxation. We will touch on all of those. So let's talk a little bit about the anesthesia care team. This topic and just the terminology surrounding um, medicine in general can be very confusing and complex. We use a lot of uh, abbreviations and a lot of really lengthy words that you don't use in everyday language. So I think it's important to kind of delineate between a certified registered nurse anesthetist, which is what I am, a CRNA for short, and then an anesthesiologist. So here's a little comparison just to give you a side-by-side -side view. They're different, they have different school tracks. So edu this, the first uh, row here is in years. So eight to nine years versus 12. This is meaning eight to nine years past high school is what a, a CRNA would have to go through the, this day and time. Most of our programs for anesthesia school have turned into three years and we get our doctorate of nursing practice. So our school time is a little bit lengthened. So after high school, we do four years of undergraduate studies, and usually that would be in nursing. And then you would have at least one, but usually it's much more than that, one to four years probably on average of intensive care unit work in the hospital system. So this would be like an ICU where the most critical patients are in a hospital. And then you would do nurse anesthesia school, which is three years, and that's three years full time, so 36 months, so eight to nine years total. For an anesthesiologist, that would be 12 years, four years going to your four-year university after high school, four years of medical school, and four years of residency. And so the curriculum track is kind of what I just talked about. And then the credentials are a little bit different. So credentials just means the abbreviations behind your name. So for me, because I had my doctorate of nursing practice, my, it would be Emily Barr, DNP, okay? For an anesthesiologist, it would be Emily Barr, MD, for medical doctor. And then DO is a uh, doctor of osteopathic medicine, just a different type of medical school. All right, so let's do a little bit of airway anatomy. So as an anesthesia providers, we are airway experts. So we deal a lot with, and you've probably seen on television, I hate to say that, but we all watch Grey's Anatomies or The Good Doctor or any of these medical shows. So we, our job, main job is to secure the airway by a breathing tube. So it's very important for us when we meet patients in the morning before they have their surgery, we assess everything about them. So we need to know about all of their health, not just their airway, but the airway is a large focus of our job. 
So we'd have them open up their mouth. How do their teeth look? How wide can they open their mouth? It's important for us to look and see if we can see their uvula hanging, which is that dangly piece of tissue that you probably notice when you look in the mirror and open your mouth and say, ah. So that's something we have every patient do. Um, the respiratory system. This is something I just want you to think about, and I'll answer it as we work our way through this slide. But where would you think from top to bottom, so top being your head, bottom being your feet, from top to bottom, where is the most upper part or the most top part of your respiratory system. So if you think about where you bring air in when you're taking a nice big deep breath of oxygen, where do you bring that, move that air through? Well, it starts in your nose. So the nose is a part of your respiratory system. So that's moving the air through the nose to the back of your throat, down your trachea. You can kind of follow this diagram into your lungs and then you exhale that CO2. So that just kind of shows you your breathing track from when you take a big deep breath in, kind of where that air moves down to your lungs and then comes back out as you exhale. And this third picture is very busy and I get that. So the main point I wanted to show you is when we do assessments, where when we're meeting patients and going over these things, we are looking at how easy or difficult it's gonna to be to maybe intubate or place a breathing tube on a patient. So if we can see your uvula, so if you look in the mirror and can see your uvula, we would consider you a class one. So you can look at this chart and see in the, that middle line, that gray um, row there, you'd be a class one. Some people believe it or not, and it's just the way that they're built and that's okay. When they open their mouth, you can't see their uvula. So we are built a little bit different. Here's a little bit more, a little bit more, and these, uh, this is a more advanced, and I want you to know that a lot of this content is very difficult, and so it's okay if it's a little bit over your head, but I just want to show you so some of it can kind of come together as we move along throughout the presentation. So with this picture here on the left, picture number one, that silver blade type device is what we call a laryngoscope. So Larynx is the area of your throat where you have your voice box. That's where you produce sound, where your vocal cords move closed and open and they produce um, phonation or sound. So this is how you talk to your friends and your family. So with this laryngoscope, when we place that on the back of your tongue and into your throat, we're able to see into your to, through your vocal cords. So the picture on the right, number two, you can see those two vocal cords and how they're opened up. So with that, that's, that is the area where we, or your windpipe, you probably heard, where you'd place that breathing tube right through there. So when we have that blade in someone's mouth, that's what we're looking at. When we do the simulation here at the end, you will get a visualization of the vocal cords here and what it looks like when we intubate somebody or place a breathing tube. So let's do a little bit of um, anesthesia terminology. So phases of general anesthesia. So that is me on the right, just so you know. So these pictures have been um, okay to be in this presentation, but we don't show any patient identifiers, but I'm actually I'm holding a mask on a patient's face and they're just breathing in some oxygen. And this is kind of the time where we're getting them asleep before we place the breathing tube. So this is called the induction phase. So that's the initiation of anesthesia. So that just means we're pushing drugs through an IV and we're putting the patient to sleep. On TV, and honestly, a lot of patients, you know, say this to us when we meet them, but you know, I remember the last time I was put to sleep, I count back, I counted backwards from 10 and I only got to eight. Well, I haven't seen personally any patients count back from 10. That's more of like a Hollywood reflection of what it's like to go to sleep in the operating room. But that would be the induction phase when you're counting back from 10. You wouldn't get too far and you definitely wouldn't even remember counting. There's, the drugs we use are very powerful and they work very fast. The next phase of general anesthesia is the maintenance phase. So this is where the surgery is occurring. So we're keeping the patient asleep or under a deep anesthetic state, and that's easily achieved by the medicines and then the gas that they're breathing in. So through that breathing tube that's placed, they're breathing in some of that anesthesia gas 
um, that is given by our ventilator machine. I'll show you more pictures of these. And then lastly is the emergence phase. So that's the recovery from general anesthesia. So once the surgery is wrapping up, we'll give medications that'll help kind of bring the patient back to consciousness, the back to this world. And then they'll start to breathe for themselves, take nice, big, deep breaths. And then we can take that breathing tube out and take them to the recovery room. Here's some more terminology. So this is another picture. This is doing the intubation here. So analgesia is a term um, for related to pain. So it's just a way of saying pain medication. So analgesia is medicine that we can give to alleviate any pain that you would have in surgery. Now, this doesn't, this isn't just for anesthesia. Analgesia medications can be something like Tylenol and ibuprofen. So you've probably taken that many times if you've had a headache, but then we have much stronger analgesic meds like opioids, something like fentanyl. We kind of talked a little bit about intubation. So intubation is the art of placing that breathing tube and using the laryngoscope. So I brought a little prop with me and it's just, you'll have a better picture of this, but this is a laryngoscope here. So you can kind of see for scale, the size of it. So it has a bright white light. I don't mean to blind you, but that way we can see those vocal cords. Extubation is the opposite of intubation. So that is that occurs during that emergence phase of anesthesia where we take that breathing tube out. And then we're gonna have the endotracheal tube. So I've been referring to it as a breathing tube, but it's, its formal name is an endotracheal tube. A lot of anesthesia terminology is based on medical root words. So if you haven't had like a medical careers class like I did when I was in high school, then you probably don't know a lot of these root words, but this would be something that you would learn in a fundamental class. So like a foundational class of any healthcare, you would learn the root word. So endotracheal, so your trachea, so it's just saying inside your trachea. So it's a breathing tube, endotracheal, abbreviated as ETT. Mechanical ventilation is once we place a breathing tube and we hook you up to our anesthesia machine, that machine breathes for you because the medicines we give you, you're not breathing, you know, you're not. So that sounds very dangerous, but really we're controlling all of your breathing. We're controlling how many, how fast or how slow you're breathing, how big of a breath or how small of a breath you're taking. So it's actually really cool. We can kind of just do all your body, what your body normally does for itself. We can do it with our medications and our equipment. And then Mac. So this is like the English dialect right here, because you know how we have the sun, like the sunshine, and then like a daughter and son, how we spell things differently. It sounds the same, but it's different. Well, here's a different example in anesthesia. Mac, we have three different uh, abbreviation explanations for Mac. So the first one is a Mac and a Miller blade. So this is the type of laryngoscopes that we use to intubate and place a breathing tube. So um, the next slide here, I have a picture to kind of show you. So the top two pictures explain and just demonstrate the difference between a Mac and a Miller blade. So the Mac blade is the curved blade on the left. And then the Miller blade is a straight blade. They are essentially the same. It's just user preference. I prefer the Miller blade. I like the straight blade better but it's, both of them are equally great. So it just depends on what the provider wants to use. Now you can see also for scale, I included pediatric size blades. So the larger blades would be the size for an adult. The smaller blades are the size for like an infant or a small kid. So everything in anesthesia that we use, it gets scaled down very small if, the, if it's a, a little baby compared to an older adult. Let's go back to our little terminology. So our second MAC abbreviation is monitored anesthesia care. That's just another type of sedation where we're for like a colonoscopy, where we'd give you just medicine through your IV and make you sleepy, but you would still be breathing for yourself. And then we have mon monitored alveolar concentration. That is a big fancy word for how we measure how deep under anesthesia you are. So, whew. I'm tired of talking about Mac. 
unless we talk about a Big Mac. All right, next. Is anybody hungry? It's dinner time. All right, so with this, these pictures here, I just want to show you. So with the mask on the bottom, so the bottom left picture is an adult mask versus a child's mask. So it again, just shows you the different sizes. So that's what we use when we're having patients breathe in that oxygen before they go to sleep. And then the picture on the right on the bottom, those are your endotracheal tubes. So you have a, a larger one for an adult, and then you would have a much smaller one for a little baby. So that's about the small as we get right there. A few more terminology items. So this picture is great. This shows you our monitor. So these include all of our vital signs. So the, the vital signs is an umbrella word to describe your heart rate, blood pressure, all the things we're monitoring. So this monitor, we'll kind of like break this, some of these numbers down to, so just you can understand kind of what we're looking at and monitoring why you would be asleep under anesthesia. The first word is those volatile agents or also known as inhalational agents because as you inhale, you breathe in. So the anesthesia gases that you're breathing in. If you remember when we talked about the history of anesthesia, the gases we used back in the day were ether, chloroform, and nitrous oxide. Today, our three main gases are isofluorine, sevofluorine, and desfluorine. So there, these gases are much safer and much more predictable than the more risky meds they used way back when. So those are those anesthesia gases. Next, we have normal sinus rhythm. So that's just a way of saying you have a normal heartbeat. So normal heartbeats would be something like 60 to 99 beats per minute. Your heart would beat that many times. That would be a normal sinus rhythm. So a little at-home activity while we're sitting here. If you, with your pointer finger and your middle finger, if you place it right here in that little crevice of your wrist on your thumb side on the inside, you can probably find your pulse. You can feel that little pulsation. So that's an artery. So you'll, this is actually called your radial artery. So whenever you don't have to do it now, but just, you can just locate it. And this is an activity you can always do to kind of see how hard your, your body's working, but you can count your pulse. And you can give yourself 15 seconds and count how many times you feel that pulse in 15 seconds, times it by four, and that will give you a minute, right? And that total number would be your beats per minute that your heart is beating. So normal is 60 to 99. Of course, you could be above that and have a fast heart rate, or you could be below that and have a slower heart rate. Most of you young kids will have a slower heart rate than 60, and that's okay. And then a systole means no heart rate or a flat line. So if you've watched a TV show and everybody's running into the room and you see that heart rate just go straight across and everybody's panicking, that would be flat line, a systole, no heartbeat. So that would be a cardiac arrest type of scenario. That's when we would start giving chest compressions because if the heart's not beating, you need to start pumping that blood that's in the heart. All right, and here's a little bit more medical terminology. These might be something you're a little bit more familiar with. So when we're talking about the heart rate, um, you've probably heard on television like, I need an EKG stat, which means like right now. So it's something that's very urgent. You don't have time to go drink your coffee or drink your Mountain Dew and then do it. You need to do it now. So stat means right this minute. It's, a, it's an extreme emergency. Then you have the abbreviation PRN. This simply means as needed. So your doctor may have told you or your mom or dad has said, you can take an ibuprofen if you have a headache. You can take that as needed. So that would just simply mean ibuprofen, PRN, as needed. Of course, we know we usually take those like every four hours. And then DNR means do not resuscitate. So resuscitate is kind of a big word, but it's associated with like a cardiac arrest type scenario. So if somebody's a do not resuscitate, that means we're not going to give them chest compressions. We're not going to shock their heart and we're not going to intubate them and place a breathing tube if they're not breathing. So do not resuscitate. And then you have what's called a code blue. This is kind of um, the same as a cardiac arrest. 
So code blue would be when somebody is, let's say, playing a basketball game and they're running down the court, all of a sudden they collapse and stop breathing. That would be where you would maybe find your AED that's in your school. I'm sure you've all seen AEDs. AEDs are also in a lot of public places, arenas. You can kind of find malls. They're everywhere nowadays. So our AED in the hospital system is called a ZOL, and it's pictured on this picture right here. So the little TV screen looking thing is our ZOL. So if we had a patient that was a code blue scenario or cardiac arrest and they were in a rhythm that was very dangerous and they couldn't live like that, those pads would be placed on them and they would be shocked. And this is our code blue or cardiac arrest part. So it has everything we need in there to try to save somebody's life. Here's some more monitors. So EKG, I kind of mentioned that earlier, but like that just is a larger term to describe your heart rate. So that's how we monitor your heart rate, electrocardiogram. So if you look at the monitor picture here on your right, the top right, that green kind of squiggly line, that's the person's heart rate. So it's 41 beats per minute. So we said normal was like 60 to 99. This is 40. So it's a little bit slow. That's okay. Um, the next line down is the blood pressure. So you probably, normally we measure this in most settings with a, a cuff that wraps around your arm and that gives you your blood pressure number. Then you have your SpO2, which means pulse oximetry. And so that will be that kind of wavy, light blue, Carolina blue line. Um, and we want that to be 93 to 100%. So this patient had a 98 percentile, which is very good. That just is a, a number reflecting how much of our blood cells are saturated to connect it to oxygen. Another monitor we use is the end tidal CO2. So this is how when you're under anesthesia and you're breathing in gases and you, as you breathe those gases in, you also have to still exhale. So as you exhale, that is a, you're exhaling carbon dioxide. So we monitor that as well. So on this screen here, you can see kind of like, it looks like white mountains. It's very um, rhythmic like that would be your end tidal. So that number says 32 beside it, if you can find that. And that's in a normal range. And then we definitely measure your temperature because the operating room is a very cold place. We're always bundled up. So you have to wear, um, we have to, we wear some blankets and a lot of jackets, but the patient sometimes is exposed depending on what kind of surgery they're having. So we make sure we keep you warm where we can. And we use this device called a bear hugger. And that's the picture there on the bottom right. So you have this air warmed blanket over you that this machine can kind of pump through there to keep you warm. So here's some more technology and equipment. So all three of these pictures contain our anesthesia machine or also known as our gas machine. So this is our main method of how we deliver our anesthesia. So we can start from left to right just for simplicity because that's just the right order. So when, when I'm looking here at this first monitor, this patient is already under anesthesia. They're intubated. I know that they're connected um, to my gas machine and I can monitor all of the different volumes that they're breathing. So how big of volumes are they breathing? How fast are they breathing? And then the middle picture here is just me playing with one of our other um, airway devices that we have. And then the last picture here, the third picture, is a good view of the anesthesia machine. So what I'm doing there is I'm dialing how much oxygen or air I'm delivering to the patient. And that will be delivered through that purple circuit to the patient and they'll breathe that in with the mask until they get asleep and then we'll intubate them. Okay, here's more technology and equipment. So this is just a comparison of different IV pumps that we use. So IV is, so IV for intravenous. So that's when you've probably been to the doctor or it's, it's kind of like when you get blood, get your blood drawn, but this is when a catheter, the IV catheter would stay in your vein. And then we would give you fluid through a line. So the picture here on the left shows you a lot of different IV drugs that were given a patient through an, a, a certain line that they have. So that just shows you a comparison of how IV pumps can look different. All of our equipment, dependent on which hospital you're at, everything can look different. They all do the same thing, just work a little bit differently. 
I think this picture on the left was at Wake Med in Raleigh. That's what their pumps look like. And then this picture on the right is here in Greensboro. That's how our pumps look. And here's some more technology and equipment. So that's the that's our version of the AED. So that would be how we shock patients. We actually call ours the Zoll, Z-O-L-L. -L. And then that's an up close picture of our defibrillation pad. So that it would show you exactly where you would place those pads on a patient. So you'd place one on the front and then one on the back. All right, pharmacology. One of our favorite sayings is you can't wake up if you don't go to sleep. So these show you some of the meds we give to put you to sleep. So these are our main staple medications that we use daily. We'll work from left to right um, on the first picture here. So that orange label medication is called midazolam, also known as Versed. And that medication is given to just kind of decrease your anxiety. It doesn't put you completely to sleep, but we usually give it to you on the way to the operating room. So you, it kind of takes the edge off and that way you're not so nervous because it's very scary having surgery. We want to make you feel more relaxed and enjoy it a little bit more, even though you don't, but we want you to enjoy it. We want to make you not so, you know, nerve wracking and all that. It's just a nerve wracking experience. The next med there is fentanyl. So then the blue label is fentanyl and that's an analgesic medication. So that would be given for pain. The med after that is lidocaine. So what that does is numb your vein a little bit because that big white syringe is propofol and that puts you to sleep and it can kind of burn a little bit. So we give you the lidocaine and then we give you the propofol and that'll put you to sleep usually less than 30 seconds. The two red syringes after that are called our paralytics. So you've probably heard the word paralyzed before. So paralytics paralyze all of your muscles. That sounds very scary, but when we intubate you, when we look with our laryngoscope and we put that into your mouth and we look for your vocal cords, we have to give you that paralytic medication to make your vocal cords open up so we can place the breathing tube. Once we do that and connect you to our anesthesia machine, we're able to breathe for you. And that just makes it ideal surgical conditions to have the operation. So it's for your safety and then we have it under control and then we can reverse everything we've done. So that way when it's, the surgery is done, you're waking up. And on the right side here, that just shows you how medication syringes can look different at other hospitals. So it's, it's always a little bit different, but the medications would do the same. All right, here's a little video, this is good. So this is, um, when we're drawing up medications, it's very important we have to check the patient. So we're gonna make sure we're giving the right medication to the right patient. So that involves looking at the patient's name, their medical record number, their date of birth. And then we also have to double, triple check the medication that we're given. So this, let's just play this video. It has no sound, I'm gonna talk through it for you. So here I'm pulling out propofol, that's that sedation medicine. So I pull it out of our Pixis, which is the name of the machine there that holds all of our meds. I scan this and it spits out a label for propofol. So this is important because we draw up, meaning we pull up a lot of different medications and syringes to deliver to patients. So we have to make sure that the syringe is labeled correctly. If you recall from that last page, every syringe had a different label on it. Really the importance of that, most of the meds that we give are clear, so they all would look the same. We have a certain sequence or an order that we need to give medication. Propofol, as you remember, is this white medication, so it looks vastly different. Well, we don't wanna give a paralytic, so a medication that paralyzes you, we don't wanna give that before we put you to sleep. You don't wanna be paralyzed and awake and not be able to you know, talk or move. That is extremely scary and terrifying. We would never do that. So we have to label the medication so we know we're giving you the medications in the correct order. So this machine helps us do that. Next slide. So this is everyday workflow. So this is gonna give you a peek into my office. So this is actually an operating room for open heart surgery, which is a very intense surgery that we do. 
So this operating room has a lot of stuff going on. So I'm going to kind of talk you through things that you're seeing. We'll start here, IV pumps. And those are the medications that would be given IV to a patient. We kind of did this in the last video, but here's Pixis. So that holds all of our medications and some of our supplies. So we have to know what all of these medications do. There's a medication for everything and there's a medication to reverse it. So there's all the meds that I drew up for my heart patient. So I just always, you always make sure everything's there and just like how you need it. So when you get into the room, you can put the patient asleep quickly. We have more drawers with other monitors and things that we would need in the room at any given time. That's our IV supplies. So to start an IV, and then those are just some other miscellaneous supplies. If we run out of medications in our Pixis, we have this emergency drug box. So I could pop that open and get out anything I needed in case we had like a code blue or a cardiac arrest scenario. Here's our anesthesia gas machine and our monitor. So here's my airway setup. So this is what I set up when it's time to put a patient to sleep. So we have a breathing tube, we have an oral airway. This is a tube that goes into the stomach, which helps suck out air and then and, and all the other like stomach contents. This is just showing our machine again. I show you, hey, I like the Miller blade, that straight blade. So I have that set up. And if you recall, the other blade is a Mac blade. It's curved. Again, just for preference. You can see here, this is our operating table. That's where the patient will lay, but there, um, all those boxes there get moved. So don't worry, they don't have to lie on top of all of that. We have our anesthesia circuit here. So this is how you'll see me pull it out is this kind of stretchy tubing and it gets connected to the mask here. And then that would be put up to the patient's face so they could breathe that anesthesia oxygen and breathe and I could dial it up there like those knobs, that's oxygen and air. So I could give them oxygen and here's my anesthesia gases, SIVO, ISO, and the blue is DES. So I would just dial those up and turn them like you're opening up a, a, a jar and I could increase my anesthesia depth to make them deeper under anesthesia. So all of the, the airflow from the machine comes in one side to the patient and then the other side of the tubing takes the, the exhaled contents away. And when it comes away, it comes through our ventilator here and it gets um, kind of filtered so we don't, so the patient doesn't have to rebreathe that, that expired um, CO2 in the air that they, in, the, in the gas that they've actually exhaled, the anesthesia gas. So it gets filtered there with our soda lime absorbent and then it comes up through some of this tube in here and goes out into the atmosphere. So that way we don't have to sit there and rebreathe as the providers, we won't have to rebreathe all of that anesthesia that the patient has exhaled because then we would be feeling very woozy and we have to stay very alert and with it because we're monitoring all those things that we talked about. And so this is just the view into my office. Of course, nobody's in here, but this was done at like 6 a.m. before I went and met my patient in the morning. And that's that. All right, on to the next. Okay, so this is a part where this is a warning because we do have some graphic content here. I think it's very, I'm going to give, I'm going to talk just for a little bit just to give um, people at home a little bit of time to step away if they get real oozy when they see blood. So this is your chance to step away for a minute. And then once this, um, we're past this next slide, I'll let you know when it's safe to come back. But anesthesia is not just, you know, very, it's not routine all the time. It's not it is exciting and we're doing a bunch of different skills and we're working with people and we're putting them to sleep and we're, they're having a surgery and then we're waking them up and then they have no recollection of that. But there's times when it's really sad and it's scary and it's adrenaline pumping because we see things such as motor vehicle accidents. So we have patients come in that have been in really bad car accidents and we have patients that don't make it sometimes. We have traumas, gunshot wounds, people that have fallen off of ladders are from very high heights. So they have severe orthopedic or bone breaks and everything, head injuries. So we, we see it all. 
And it's not always a happy ending, unfortunately. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to move on to the next screen here in three, two, and one. So this is, like I said, the not so glamorous side. This is real footage. You can't see anything, but that would identify a person. But I just want you to know this person actually survived. So this is a good story. But you can see all the blood on the floor. Um, this was a, a trauma um, that happened. And you can see that sometimes we're, and then you can see the blood products on the far right picture. So sometimes we are pouring in, giving blood transfusions as fast as we can because patients are bleeding out as quick as we're giving them blood. That's terrifying. Um, so it's not always a happy ending. Sometimes we're, there's 10 of us in there just giving, just pumping blood products in to try to keep a person alive. So it's, you're, not a, you're not there by yourself. When, when something like this is going on, you have a strong team beside you to help because the patient is the number one priority. That is why we're there. We are there to take care of this person's father, son, sister, aunt, grandmother, we are there to take care of somebody's family member. And it is a very extreme and important responsibility. We are going to the next slide if anybody had to step away. So this is kind of the fun part. Let's debunk Hollywood. So I just found a couple of examples here to just show you that what you see on TV isn't always accurate. You know, I think for the most part, TV shows and movies do a relatively good job of depicting the life in healthcare, but they sometimes have some misses. So this first picture here on the left is from the movie, A Million Dollar Baby. So the interesting part about this is, um, I believe, so this was Hillary Swank. She was a boxer, I believe, and she ended up getting paralyzed. So she was a quadriplegic, meaning her arms and her legs didn't work. Therefore, she wasn't able to breathe for herself either because it was where her injury occurred on her spinal column. So she had a long-term breathing tube, which is what we call a tracheostomy. So it's placed right here. You can kind of feel your trachea here in your neck and nobody can see you at home. You can do this. I'm just, you know, touching my neck here for you just to give you an example but you can feel the ridges of your trachea. So that's where that would be placed and it's below your vocal cords. So because of where it's located, you're unable to talk. She was connected to mechanical ventilation, meaning the machine was breathing for her, yet she was talking during this scene with her, I believe it was her trainer. So that's not real life, that would never happen. So there's that. This second example is from the movie Awake. This occurred, um, I, think it, I think it came out in 2007. So it's, it's a pretty old movie. But um, maybe that was before some of y'all were born. Man, okay. Anyways, <laughs> so this movie Awake is about someone who had, I think they were having heart surgery. And it's one of those situations I kind of described to you where they could hear and they were awake during surgery, but they couldn't move. So this would be a situation where they were given that medicine that paralyzes you, yet they weren't completely asleep. And this movie said that um, this occurs in one out of every 700 anesthesia cases, and that is false. So it really, um, we actually get questions about this in real life. I think patients are genuinely concerned that they're gonna be awake when they have surgery. And a lot of times they'll say like, last time I remember, you know, I being in the operating room. And a lot of that means that they probably woke up and they were in their recovery room and their kind of memory is kind of blending together. But this would not happen. So I can assure you anesthesia is safe. All right. And let's do the COVID-19 impact. So you can see in a short amount of time, the United States and every healthcare system in our world had to revamp healthcare as we know it. So we had to revamp healthcare in a record time. For here in Greensboro, um, they opened up a COVID only hospital, and a lot of places in our nation did that as well, and other areas of the world where COVID patients could just get treated all together. I included some pictures to kind of show you, kind of, and the first picture here on the, the first on the left of the bottom 
is I have those indentions on my face and that's from an N95. And you can, you've probably seen a lot of pictures like this and there's pictures where people's faces look much worse, but it hurts. It's hard to wear that all day. So these healthcare workers have really been putting in a lot of time and grit and just, it's been a long, tiring year. So, and it's been a long, tiring year for all of us in healthcare or not. So that just kind of shows my face after one of my shifts. I was pretty, I was pretty tired at that point. The middle picture is showing it's called a capper, but it's another type of full PPE. It's a little less restrictive than wearing a tight N95 mask. So that's just me. I was actually working at the COVID hospital that night and I had to intubate two COVID patients. So I took a picture just because I knew I was doing this presentation. And I wanted to show y'all. And then this last picture, when I look like I'm in a space suit, that was not a COVID patient, but I just wanted to show you different types of um, PPE or personal protective equipment we wear. This was actually taking care of a patient that had, I think, lice and maybe bed bugs. So we see it all. We take care of it all. We don't care what's going on with a patient. We always take care of them, but we have to protect ourselves. So just to finish up about COVID, you know, this has been a continuous process of understanding this virus and disease. Every day, month, week, we're learning something different and it's ever evolving. So I hope 2021 brings us a little bit more stability and help so we can kind of get back to our new normal and be around our family and friends. I want to touch on the, I talked about the PPE, that personal protective equipment. Next is the fear factor. When this started about a year ago, it really, you know, amped up. We were all pretty terrified. You know, we didn't know much about COVID. We were seeing young people get the virus and be really sick as well as old people. So there was, no one was exempt from this and no one is exempt from COVID. So we were all a little bit scared um, and still are for good reason, but it's becoming more normal taking care of COVID patients. Like I said, we take care of everyone. And then we did touch on the COVID only hospitals. All right, here is our part one of our, the wrap up of this lecture. So this is gonna be seeing the big picture. So this shows you what it's like for a CRNA to meet her patient, hit her or his patient in pre-op. So this kind of gives you an example of our pre-op interview. It's very quiet at first, but the volume will get louder. Of you. What's your name? My name is Martha Smith. Okay, and what's your date of birth? It is 71059. Okay, and what are we doing for you today? Well, I, I have something icky stomach. I think I'm getting my gallbladder out. Okay, well, that's what this says on your consent. So okay. that, that sounds good, and the surgeon is Dr. Blackman. Nice. Okay, good. Well, have you ever had anesthesia before? No. Okay. Any family history of issues with anesthesia? Nothing that I know of. Nothing like a high fever or muscle rigidity? Nothing. Like I haven't heard of anything Okay. Like that. And have you, do you have any chest pain or shortness of breath? Not usually, unless I run up a flight of stairs. But. That, that's normal. I get yeah. tired with that too. Okay. Any allergies that you're aware of? No allergies. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I am allergic to peanuts. You're allergic to peanuts? Yeah. Well, we won't be giving you any peanuts. Okay, right good. Here, so I think you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> When's the last time you ate or drank anything? Uh, it's been forever ago, like 5 p.m. yesterday. Okay, and haven't had anything to drink? I had a sip of water this morning with my meds. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to ask you to pull your mask down and do an airway assessment. We do this with everybody um, before we take them back for surgery because we'll be putting a breathing tube in, and okay. I want to make sure that we can get the best assessment, okay? Can you open up for me? Okay. Any broken, chipped, missing, loose teeth? No. Okay, can you put your teeth forward? Okay, good. Okay, and can you bend on back? Any pain with that? Mm -mm. Okay, and open up one more time. Okay, perfect. You can put your mask back up. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. All righty, and I'm gonna take a quick listen to your heart and your lungs. Okay. My heart's racing, I'm so nervous. My heart's racing. We'll give you some good medicine once we get back there and we get an IV in, okay? Okay. Everything sounds really good. Okay. Okay. 
Alrighty, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do. So when we get back there, we'll put an IV in and we'll give you some medicine to help you relax, okay? Because okay. I know this can be a little nerve-wracking. But once you get that medicine, you might, you'll still be able to be aware of what's going on, but you probably won't remember anything, okay? Okay. Then we'll be hooking you up to all of our monitors. Um, the first time the blood pressure goes up, it's a little tight. And then we'll go ahead and put a mask on your face and I want you to point your chin to the ceiling and start taking some big, deep breaths, okay? And that's okay. just to fill your lungs up with some oxygen. And then what we'll go ahead and do is we'll go ahead and start giving you some medication through your IV and then you won't remember any of this and we'll put a breathing tube in, okay? So with the breathing tube, we will be putting that in and you'll be asleep at that point. And there is always a little bit of risk of damage to the teeth, but I don't think we'll have any issues with that. And then um, you may have a little bit of soreness in your throat afterwards. And I'll be completely out. You'll be the breathing tube. Is you'll be complete. completely asleep. Is that the same thing as intubation? That is the same thing okay. as intubation. I've heard yes. that on TV. Sorry, yes, that's, okay. what, that's what it's called. Okay. And with my, am I going to have big incisions? No, my stomach. so it's a laparoscopic surgery. And laparoscopic, so, what does that mean? So laparoscopic is they're going to do like probably three little incisions. And so he's going to use gas to help blow your stomach up so he can see. And so that's why we're going to have you intubated. Okay. Uh, okay. That's what the surgeon told me. That's okay. right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Well, do you have any questions for me? I'm ready to just get this over with. All right. So I can go home and have a big cheeseburger. Ah, uh, well, we'll take really good care of you. And we'll give you some medicine back there also for nausea and any pain. Okay. okay. Thank you, Allie. You're welcome. All right. Did y'all recognize that patient? All right. And then on to part two, seeing the big picture. So this is the sequence where we do induction and intubate someone. So this is kind of ties everything in that we've talked about. And it'll be quiet and then it'll get louder. Hey, Miss Smith, I'm going to start an IV so we can give you some medications and get you to sleep. So, tight band around your arm while I start the IV. The first time this blood pressure cuff goes off, it's going to be a little tight and then it gets better after that, okay? Miss Smith, this is a little pitch as the IV goes in and then we'll get you sleepy. I'm going to go ahead and put this mask on your face. This is just to go ahead and pre-oxygenate you and get your lungs all filled before we go ahead and put you to sleep and put that breathing tube in. The IV's working IV's well. IV's in good? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and give you some her medications. We're, Brooke's going to go ahead and give you some midazolam, which is Versed, to help you just relax, and some pain medication, some fentanyl. You're Here's doing the great. Versed. And here's the narcotic fentanyl. You doing okay? We'll take really good care of you. You're doing great. Blood pressure looks great. Everything looks good. Here's some lidocaine. That's just going to help numb before this other medication we give you that will help make you sleepy, the propofol. All right, Ms. Smith, this next medication could burn a little bit. It's called propofol. You're doing great. A few more big deep breaths. Miss Smith, can you open your eyes? No lash reflex. It's time to give Rockeronium, which is a paralytic. This medication will paralyze Miss Smith's vocal cords, so Allie will be able to intubate the patient correctly. Rockeronium is in. Okay. Are you able to mask Ms. Smith? I am a little bit, but not getting the best in title, so I'm going to go ahead and put an oral airway in. Okay. okay. All right, that's much better. How are you doing? All I see is the epiglottis. Can you add me a little bit of pressure? Yes. No. This pressure helps with anterior airways to better view the I'm still cords. not having much of a view. Okay. Let's go ahead and use the glide since I already have it in here. Okay. I'll put our oral in and we'll mask her up. Her saturations are 98. 
So good chest rise. Okay, you ready to do it? Thank you. And if you'll hold her lip. Okay. Thank you. Through the cords. Okay. Perfect. Style it. Style it out. Okay. I'm going to inflate the cuff. Okay. And if you'll hold this, I'll go ahead and listen. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Chest Good rise. chest rise bilaterally. Okay. Good. Where are we at, Brooke? We are 20 at the lip. Okay. Trying some gas on. I'm going to go ahead and take that. Blood pressure was good through all induction. Clean up my area. I'll go ahead and put the biz monitor on. Put her twitch monitor on. All right, no twitches. Okay. And that concludes our presentation. Do we have any questions? We have a, a question period. And I know this material is very dense and I know we're short on time. So I'm going to go ahead and um, exit out to this. Let's see here. So we can see if there are any questions throughout the segment. But thank you so much for your time and attention. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I hope that you have some interest in anesthesia. And if you do, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Thank you, Dr. Barr. So we've got a couple of questions from the YouTube chat. First is from Lauren, and she asks, was your CRNA program much more difficult than your ABSN program? Very good question. Um, I think, you know, what's interesting is when you leave high school, high school is challenging, right? You take hard classes, then you go to undergrad. And that seems much different and more complex. So I think as you get older, you become more mature and able to handle increased workload. So ABSN was challenging because it was a short amount of time because I had already had a bachelor's degree. So I did get my nursing degree in 14 months. And then my doctorate program for anesthesia was three months or three years. It was much more <laughs> challenging. However, I felt that I was more settled in life and I was able to handle it. And it, I knew that was my passion at that point. So that was good. All right. Next is from Sashank. And he asks, what is the difference between an, an anesthetist and an anesthesiologist? Very good question. So with that slide where I kind of compared the, the, the big difference is the educational track, a nurse anesthetist and very good job pronouncing that. That's a really hard word. <laughs> so kudos to you. Um, but a nurse anesthetist goes the nursing school route. So that's the nursing school track, whereas an anesthesiologist is a medical doctor and goes through medical school. So I think for me, I had a lot of experience working in hospitals. And because of the medical mission trips and the job shadowing that I did, I was able to see the differences between nurses and physicians and the role they play with patients. And I knew I liked that quality time with patients. So nursing seemed more suited for me. I also knew that the schooling was shorter and I could work some along the way. And that was very attractive because I wanted to start making some money so I could go on really cool trips. And so I just kind of thought of it as a gradual approach. All right. Next from Lillian. How does the process of anesthesia, I'm guessing, differ if the patient has asthma? Very good question. So 
a part of the time when we're meeting a patient, we have to look at all of their body systems. We have to understand, do they have hypertension? So high blood pressure. We think about their lungs. Do they have asthma? If they have asthma, we have to think about using, using the anesthesia machine, the ventilator and controlling that person's ventilation is a more increased risk of challenges with them. Um, if they have acute asthma where they have to use their albuterol inhaler every day, that's something we would think about. So we would ask them like, use your inhaler before we go back. And then we could give them albuterol treatments through our anesthesia machine during the procedure. So you can, you could expect that they could have more challenges, but most of the time they do pretty good. All right. Next is from David. How and when did you decide or become interested in anesthesia? And why did you decide to become a CRNA? These are all such good questions. Thank you. So um, it took me a while. I, you know, like I said, I kind of got a little bit jumbled at the beginning of my intro. But um, I, I knew I wanted to do it. I think the best advice is just expose yourself to many different opportunities. So you know, I was a biology major, so I worked at the Center for Marine Science in a research lab. I then also worked at a hospital with the, in the neonatal intensive care unit. So I worked with nurses, physicians. I went on medical mission trips. I was able to be firsthand in these experiences. My first real interaction with the nurse anesthetist, I was actually job shadowing the surgeon in Wilmington, North Carolina. This was during my biology degree. And I got put at the head of the bed with this woman and it could be, there's CRNAs are men too, by the way, but this particular person was a woman and I was watching her like move all these gadgets around and play with like all the knobs and look at the monitors. And I'm like, what is your job? It is so cool. What are you doing? And she's like, I'm a nurse anesthetist. And I was like, a nurse, what is that? You know, so that was my first exposure from then. I was kind of like a little bug in my ear all the time. And then going to nursing school and then really kind of doing my ICU nursing. And then I was like nurse practitioner versus CRNA. And then I job shadowed both of those disciplines and realized I really like the high adrenaline, busy um, skill set of nurse anesthetist. Okay. Very comprehensive answer. Thank you. Yeah. Next, what happens if you ingest anesthesia drugs? So are you saying if you like swallow medication that's supposed to go through your IVs? I, I would assume so. I think okay. that's what I meant. All right. This is interesting because we have something whenever the absorption is different. So if I'm giving you a medication through your vein, let's see if I can find a big old vein like this, right? So if I have a needle in this vein and I'm giving you medication through that, it has a direct route to your heart. So it's going to get circulated through your body quickly. And it's, you're going to get a lot of that agent at once. The same kind of concept when you're breathing in the anesthesia through the gas machine, that's the same concept. Well, if you just drink the medications, you get a small fraction of that because some of it gets absorbed like through your esophagus, it goes into your stomach. Some of it will go to your liver where it will get metabolized, but it would be such a small fraction by the time it got there. It could be excreted in urine. So a lot of it would be lost, not as effective. All right. Next up, kind of detailed, but how is the blood brain barrier issues? How are they bypassed in anesthesia? So they're really not. You have, this is, this is a pretty complex question. So if you have, let's say, um, a mother who's pregnant um, or you have and you have to think about what medications could get to a baby through a placenta, we have certain medications that we would not or we would try to avoid to protect that baby. For the blood brain barrier, um, whenever you're breathing in anesthetic gases through the ventilator, I'll just answer it this way. We can kind of um, equate that to what you're breathing in, where it crosses in the bottom levels of your lungs and mixes with your blood, we can almost say that that would be the same as the level that you would have in your brain. All right. About how many surgeries on an average day do you provide anesthesia for? 
It really depends. Um, every day I do a different type of surgery. So today, for instance, I did um, neurosurgery. So I did back surgeries and I did three different back surgeries. If I were doing a heart surgery day, we, I'd probably only do one because that's a little bit more complex and longer. But if I'm doing general surgery, such as like we're removing an appendix or a gallbladder or we're removing like a lipoma or just some sort of something small, I could probably crank out seven to eight surgeries in a eight to 10 hour day. Pretty efficient and pretty quick. All right. From Sarah, we have, what is the most difficult or complicated surgery that you've personally been a part of? So there's every day is a challenge. Anesthesia is very humbling because we take care of really healthy people and then very sick people. I think the cases that make me the most nervous would be the small babies because they're so fragile. And so we have to, like I showed you the different comparison of sizes of things that we use, adult size versus child or baby size. That also matches up with medications. We have to give them micro doses of things. So I think complex, small, like neonatal cases are pretty scary, but I love doing them. I love kids. I love working with kids. I think that's very rewarding. Um, and you get to meet the parents and you can, you know, ensure that you're going to take amazing care of their child and try to just make them feel a little bit more comfortable. So I enjoy, I enjoy those cases, but I think they are challenging. All right. Thank you. I do think we are unfortunately out of time for questions now. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience and the YouTube or on social media for sending your questions. And thank you, Dr. Barr, for your insight. Thank you. It was great. Thank you again, Dr. Emily Barr, and thank you all for coming. I personally think it was quite elegant, intriguing, and to put it frankly, fascinating to be elucidated about your projects and ongoing moments as an anesthetist. And we applaud you for your work during this pandemic. We would also like to express our severe <laughs> gratitude for the entirety of the exquisite digital media personnel for assisting us with this fine presentation. Don't forget to follow Teen Science Cafe Raleigh on Twitter, Facebook, and tag us on Instagram, and even MySpace, if you're into that kind of thing. And we will know if you don't. Also, Keep an eye out for a follow-up email containing a series of questions. Once you complete the survey, you will receive a discount code for the museum's gift shop, where you can purchase plenty of merchandise. No fossils or specimens, unfortunately. The museum has opened applications for next year's cafe coordinators. Make sure you guys apply. We would love to have the company of other teens, and don't be afraid, not all of us bite. We will also host virtual positions next year, so you don't have to live close to the museum to participate, although the museum is pretty pogged to be in. There will be a virtual information meeting for potential applicants on Sunday, March 21st, if you want to learn more about joining the CAFE coordinator team or one of the other team programs in the museum. The CAFE coordinators, in a subjective manner, are the coolest. Go to tinyurl.com slash teenproinfo to sign up. Once again, thank you to our wonderful anesthetist, Dr. Barr. Be sure to mark your calendars for April 9th for our last Teen Science Cafe of the year, when we are joined by Tatiana Heights to discuss environmental justice. And just like that, this month's Teen Science Cafe has come to an end. Thanks for joining tonight's cafe. Be sure to like the video, sedate, but not too much. And if you're in the bell icon to make sure that you never miss more premium content from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Like we have said, cafe coordinator applications are opening for the next school year. So stay tuned to our social, to our social media to get the latest updates. We're coming up on here since we've been shut down and the future looks bright. I us hope it stays that way. Thank you again, Dr. Barr, for gracing us with your presence and time out of your busy schedule. And with that, my name is Sishank. These have been your cafe coordinators. Thank you and peace.